Last year, we visited an oyster hatchery. So this year, we decided to check out an oyster farm. Welcome to Hog Island Oyster Company. Located on Tomales Bay in California, Hog Island grows oysters for both retail sales and restaurants, including five restaurants of their very own. They are the only oyster farm in the world that grows all of the main types of oysters. They also have their very own oyster hatchery, which supplies oysters to other farms. Dr. Gary Fleener is in charge of science, sustainability, and education, and he showed us around. Fun fact! Gary is also from Oklahoma. First, we got an overview of the area. This is where Hog Island Oyster Company is located. You see this thing right here, San Andreas Fault Zone? Have you heard of the San Andreas Fault? Yeah, I've heard of the movies. <laughs> yeah, well, so in geography, what we see on the map is often created by geology, like what happens underneath the surface of the earth. And this side, uh, what did you call this, the Netherlands? I called this side a real part of the Netherlands. The part of the Netherlands part is moving north, and this part is holding still. And right in the middle is a big tear that goes all the way down to the through San Francisco, and it creates this bay. It's just a little tear, and uh, we're going to go down and look at the beach here in a minute. We're good. Chicken. We think there's really chickens. That's an ocean chicken. <laughs> It's called Chicken Ranch Beach because there used to be a chicken farm there. Uh, so this is Tamales Bay. This is kind of our farm home. And uh, this is the open ocean. We've got all these things, sharks and whales and stuff. There's something else really important on all these hills back here. Does that look like an oyster to you? Nah, that's, that's, not a, an that's a cow. I tell people all the time. It's like where I grew up, oysters come from a, a different part of the tree of life, you know, and I guess <laughs> people start thinking about that. As long as they take bikes, okay. Yeah. So there are dairy farms all around us, and they make milk, and they uh, there's a lot of really important cheese makers. Did you guys go through Point Reyes? Just drove through. Drove didn't? through, yeah. There's a the grocery store is actually an incredible resource for local cheese like made or and there's dairy right across the way uh it's called point Reyes cheese and they do a great little cheese tour okay we'll you know check i mean that like out even you. even this afternoon or whatever so that's where we are california san francisco tamales bay point Reyes national seashore that looks a little bit like the netherlands when we went down to the water we talked about the tidal zone in this area, sometimes it's covered by water, and sometimes it's not. Adaptation are behaviors and characteristics that plants and animals take on to live in their environment. In this case, living in the tidal zone. One example is this rockweed. The rockweed has roots that tether it from washing away. At low tide, it lays on the ground. As the tide comes in, the air-filled bubbles on the plant let it float on the surface, where it can still absorb sunlight and photosynthesize. Egrets have long legs and beaks that make them excellent hunters in the tidal flats. Little fishes, and there's actually small shellfish, clams, and the egret's legs are only so long. Take a look again at that egret out there. If the egret got into two feet of water, it'd be... And egrets don't float very well, right? They fly well and they wave. So the egret is using the shallow water. And through the day, the egret will follow the tide up and down and feed. Even humans have adaptations, like putting buildings on stilts to be above high tide. Oysters live in the tidal zone. Oysters don't have any brains or eyes, and they cement themselves to one spot, but they have some special adaptations that help them survive. When they are covered by the tide, they open their shells and use gills to filter food out of the water. 
When they feel threatened by a predator, they slam their shell closed until the danger passes. Oysters eat tiny particles of algae, plankton, and other microscopic organisms. Another fun fact. An adult oyster can filter 60 gallons of water every day. When the tide goes out, oysters close their shells, trapping in some seawater and creating their own personal aquarium. Not only does this keep them from drying out, it protects them from being eaten because opening their shells is no easy task. Unless you're an expert shucker like Gary. Next, Gary showed us some oyster types. These, uh, these are the oysters. Hey, you mentioned the Netherlands. Yeah. Right? This oyster is native here. You go check it out. It's native to Europe. Hold it, we grow it like here, a, just don't drop but its ancestors uh, came to Europe, came from Europe. And back in the days of the Rome, you know where Italy is? Yeah? Yeah. It's got the boot thing? It's that boot. The it's boot. Just, it's so Italy. we know that the Romans were eating this kind of oysters 2,000 years ago because they wrote it all down. Last week in Maximilian had an oyster party and we enjoyed 2,000 oysters. They kept great records, I know. So and what kind of oyster is that? It's called the European flat oyster and it's the only species that lived in Europe until the introduction of more contemporary farmed oysters in the 1920s, 30s-ish. So we know that anything they ate in Roman times had to that be that. Was that one, yep. And this is the one right here that lives in the wilds of the west coast so from british columbia all the way down to baja california oregon and washington this little oyster is what grows in the wild so when we go out here if we paddled our boats across the bay and looked at the rocks we would find this kind of oyster this is what the native americans were eating this is what the gold miners were eating when they were here and then in and, about and what, the, what kind did you call it? It's called an Olympia, an a Olympia. native Olympia oyster, or, you know. And is it the only kind that was It's the only kind that was here okay. until, until uh, people came. And then in about the 1800s, ooh, now here's something cool. You see that black thing? Is that a, does that look like an oyster to you? It's a little yeah, different. Let me hold this one for you while you. You can go test it with both. Okay. You this, hold, is, hold uh, this is a mussel. It's related. And you see all those hairs? Mm -hmm. Mussels, this animal here, that's an oyster. This animal here, are you ready for this? Yeah. Super, super powers. Spider-Man threads. Can you see those Spider-Man threads in there? I see them. How do you even get rid of that? The oyster literally makes Spider-Man threads and shoots them out and sticks itself to other things. So this... Uh, mussel has stuck itself to these two oysters right here and uh, it's pretty amazing they're studying this all around the world like how do Gary said these hairs are stronger than steel yeah for for, for its, its diameter yeah. yeah for its diameter and why does it do this well because the oceans throws things around and oh, if you can't move stay. by yourself you kind of want to stay put where the food is well, that's the native oyster of the East Coast, Louisiana, and then all the eastern states from Maine through Florida. That's it. What's his name? Alabama. You know the Latin names, Virginica, but yeah, eastern oyster. Eastern. You know, on the East Coast, they call it the American oyster because they used to trade them into Europe, and the Europeans called them American oysters okay. because that's what they got. But yeah, it, so right here in my hand, bud, you can see. Uh, pretty much all the main oysters of the world in one spot. We actually happen to grow them all here. Whoa! And there's one more. That's from the east coast of North America. Mm -hmm. This one, this Olympia, is from the west coast of North America. You know, like uh, Alaska and there are oysters in Alaska, but not Hawaii. This one's from Europe, so all of those countries, France, Spain, uh, the United Kingdom, Holland, all Russia. those. Russia, you know, Russia's coastline is so far north that they don't really have oysters yeah, up also in there. Yeah, also they're blocked from everything 
Uh, and then this one, oops, actually sub this one out for a different one because this one here, yeah. This one is from Japan, and this one is also from Japan. And uh, all together, 98% or more of all the world's oysters fall in one of these five groups. Is it just Eastern? Eastern, uh, uh, the, the Virginica or American oyster. This is the Olympia, which is native to the west coast of North America. This is called the, the European flat oyster. Some people call it a Bellon. Uh, after a French estuary where they're famous. Uh, this is called the Miyagi, after the place in Japan where it originally came from. And this one is called the Kumamoto, after the place in Japan where it originally came from. These are closely related, obviously, they're both from Japan, and uh, the rest of them. So, so there's some other oysters in the world, but these are the ones that really, in Europe, they still farm this one, and the Japanese one uh, on the East Coast, they only farm this one on the West. We're, we're the only farm, we think, in the whole world, Alex, that farms all five of these in the same place. Uh, but mostly we farm the Japanese one because that's a one-year animal in terms of getting to market. That's a three-year animal. That's a four-year animal. That's a 12-year animal, right? And that's a two to three years. So this one, because it grows fast, it tastes good, and it's flexible all around the world. In France, in uh, Australia, in Japan, in China, in the west coast of the United States, Canada, Alaska, they grow this particular oyster. We were wondering, with only five kinds of oysters, why do we see so many different oysters offered on menus? To answer that, we need to back up a little bit and give an overview of the farming process. Oysters produce millions of microscopic eggs. In the wild, less than 10% survive. Those that do permanently glue themselves to other oysters, which helps them thrive, but it's not good for producing individual oysters for retail. When oysters are born in the ocean, they're microscopic. We can't see them. We could scoop up millions of them in our hands in clean water like that water and we wouldn't have any idea that they were full of oyster larvae. Little itty bitty 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 oysters. So farmed oysters start out in a hatchery in a controlled environment which allows the baby oysters to grow safely and healthy with a much higher survival rate. When the oysters get to one to three millimeters in size, they get moved from the hatchery phase to a nursery phase. Millimeter is the thickness of a penny. In the nursery, they get daily care to monitor health, condition, and growth. Once they are big enough to stay in these baskets, the oysters get moved to, into the farm. Hog Island has leases and permits from the state of California that allows them to farm oysters in Tomales Bay. They also have to maintain other permits, compliance records, and testing related to water quality, food quality, transportation, storage, and the sale of oysters. There are a lot of mechanisms in place to ensure worker, consumer, and environmental safety. The baskets protect the oysters from predators, but allow the water to freely flow around the oysters so they can feed and grow. When the oysters are ready to be harvested, they are brought in from the bay on this boat and put in tanks with highly filtered seawater, ensuring they are clean, food safe, and ready to eat. From here, they can be sold at the Hog Island Farm Shop sent to their restaurants, sold to other restaurants, or even shipped directly to consumers. We can get super fresh oysters shipped to us, even here in landlocked Oklahoma. Currently, Hog Island sells around 3 million oysters from their farm and another 5 million from other farms each year. So back to the question, why are there so many oyster types on menus? 
The answer is how an oyster looks and tastes. Depends on where and how it was farmed. When one goes up to Seattle and the other stays here, comes down to Tomales Bay and goes into baskets, because of the differences in saltiness and chemistry and plankton food that they're going to eat, when they come back and re meet each other here in California, guess what? What? Oh, somebody. gonna look like that with little frills and knuckles on it and the other one this one and the other one's gonna be really round like that one and it's the we know top secret right we know they started out identical but because this one grew in Puget Sound up in Washington and this one grew in Tamales Bay and this one grew in one kind of basket and this one grew in a different kind of basket the shape, the taste, everything about them. So when they go to the Oyster Bar, you'll see Hog Island Sweetwater and Chelsea Gem, and they may we we may have sold them their seed, but they're not gonna and no they're gonna taste different, they're gonna look different, all based on both what they're eating, the ecosystem they live in, and then what kind of culture method that we use. There's where they stay until it's time for them to sell. You wanna hold that bag for me? Got it? Yes. So, before you leave, I I want to show you how to open an oyster. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're feeling super brave, but I'll eat one if you'll eat one. What do you think? All right, Alex. You don't have to eat one, but I want to show you around the inside of one of these oysters. because, And then this is the magic sauce for Dad to help him. So, check it out. It's a top shell and a bottom shell there. And when the oyster's in the water, it has a hinge in the back and it opens up and the tides bring phytoplankton and it filters it out. And then when the tide goes out, it closes up tight, like we said, and it has a little bit of water inside of it. But the only thing holding those shells together is a little hinge in the back. And if we just pierce that hinge, we can actually take that top lid right off like that <laughs> and uh so take a look buddy see in there there's the seawater that's the thing that helps it stay alive when it's low tide and that's its one muscle do you need to be on that side so that you can see go, go move around oh yeah if you sit here. right here next to me right, right. there you go no, Oh, you don't want to see it. Oh, you don't it. want okay. to see it. I'll I got see you. it. We yeah. can look at it later. That's all right. Yeah. I thought you were the sun was in the So the seawater. So there it is. And uh, those are the uh, the gills. That's the where they filter. You can kind of see those little skinny lines in there. And they've got a whole set of those gills. And that's how they capture the food out of the water. And that's the muscle they use to close the doors. It's pretty amazing. It's a pretty simple machine. It's been around for a long time. No brain needed, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. We'll put the recipe for the sauce in the description below. But my dad wanted to try one without the sauce too. Cheers, oysters. Yeah, just salty and... And, uh, yeah, definitely Thumbs up. Pop's got <laughs> Dad shocked. That was pretty good. <laughs> that was pretty cool. If you ever get the chance to visit Hog Island or one of their restaurants, you should definitely check them out. You can learn more about them online at hogislandoysters.com, where you can also order oysters, order other great products. Thanks, Dr. Gary and Hog Island Oysters. We had a great time and we learned a lot. See you on our next adventure.